My voice is a bit lower than ordinary because I have a very bad cold. Thank you for inviting me, especially in this uh, first event of a, of a series. And thank you also for choosing the city when speaking about uh, freedom. Uh, yes, it's an old saying, uh, the air of the city makes free. Now let me uh, well, first say that I, yesterday I was working on a, on a presentation, but then I thought, how can we this early in the day and a talk on freedom really be formatted with these uh, uh, eternal PowerPoints? And so I left them uh, home and I'll speak freely uh, as it comes uh, this, uh, this morning. Let me say something about freedom. Uh, I think it's a very difficult concept. And uh, in my work, I don't have an essentialist uh, approach to it. I don't believe in free individuals. Uh, the whole idea that, uh, that it's something that exists, that you have, that is a condition, uh, uh, is uh, really uh, obscuring the, the, real, the real problem, I think, of freedom is becoming free, is freeing oneself from conditions, freeing oneself from, uh, uh, from the circumstances you, you are in. And I think it's an ongoing process. For me, uh, freedom is a, a process of emancipation. I think those speaking about uh, uh, an essentialist approach to freedom, you are free uh, uh, as a condition, uh, and especially uh, relating that uh, as an attribute to, uh, to individuals, uh, really, uh, well, which, is, which is the dominant, the dominant ideology uh, uh, of today, uh, doesn't, for instance, explain uh, why uh, fashion designers and, and, and uh, uh, publicity uh, experts know already today what we are going to consume uh, next year. We will freely choose what, that, what they are designing uh, and they are putting on the market from today onwards. So in reality, I think you can only speak about freedom if you also take into consideration the uh, conditions. We are never, ever fully free. Now, the argument is that, uh, let's say, the city is a better uh, environment, is a better condition for emancipation uh, than, let's say, the countryside or suburbia uh, uh, or outside the city. That is. Uh, absolutely my, uh, my uh, position. Now, first argument is, of course, historically. Cities are older than countries. Uh, and if you uh, discuss uh, your Europe, for instance, uh, there was a whole debate when, when the European Union was thinking of having a constitution. It ultimately became only a treaty uh, of Lisbon, basically. But they were discussing a lot about uh, the preamble uh, uh, and, and the foundations of what would be Europe. Eh? I don't know whether you remember the discussion on, uh, on the importance of Christianity uh, or on the importance of humanism. Uh, uh, well, they were, they were looking for some essential features that would, uh, that would determine uh, Europe. If I uh, would have been uh, consulted, I would have suggested urbanity. Uh, I think if you look at something specific in the European uh, history and the contribution, in fact, of, the, uh, of Europe to, uh, to the world system, it is specifically what happens in cities and even in city-states, uh, in fact. If you look at, uh, uh, let's say, the origin of modernity, where did it happen? The origin of free art, the origin of, uh, uh, of science, 
separating itself from a, a religious uh, explanation uh, system. Uh, the origin uh, uh, of, uh, of a bourgeoisie, of an entrepreneurial uh, class. And so what happened in fact, so those elements have happened in all forms of cities. What has been specific uh, in Europe is that, let's say, the, the, the emancipation uh, within that urban movement from the nobility, from feudal uh, structures, from feudal uh, uh, organized, from the empires, in fact, has been successful in Europe, has not been successful uh, at, tho at those times in other, in other continents. Don't forget that uh, the times that uh, Columbus and, and other European sailors were sailing the world to, uh, to have, uh, uh, let's say, posts in other places and, and develop ultimately the uh, international trades. The Chinese had as many uh, ships uh, uh, on the seas and were, were busy in the same way. At a certain moment, the emperor stopped that kind of, uh, of operations uh, to stabilize the territory, to stabilize uh, the empire, because uh, the internal effects uh, he, he didn't think the internal effects of, uh, of those explorations were uh, beneficial uh, for, uh, for the empire. So basically, what, is, what has happened and what has been the launch uh, of modernity and renaissance uh, uh, is the revolt of an urban entrepreneurial class, uh, of, of, of urbanism in fact, that succeeded of overthrowing uh, the clergy and nobility uh, as the power uh, as the power forces uh, and the, the origins of the of the European world system basically have been led for a long time uh, through global cities uh, Venice uh, Geneva uh, uh, Antwerp uh, for a time uh, when the Spanish oppressed the revolts here it became Amsterdam uh, moving on to uh, to London at a certain moment that it's only you could say in the, in the 19th century with the British Commonwealth uh, that the world system has been led by a central state and that the nation state, uh, that the state form has, has taken over. So basically the organization and, and the organization of Europe uh, in nation states, uh, the idea of having very exceptional, uh, weird idea in fact of, uh, uh, of having uh, uh, territorial boundaries, territorial containers, with the idea that all the people living in the container would have one language, would have one culture, uh, would have one uh, tradition, and would be uh, uh, the most homogeneous as, uh, uh, as possible, uh, as opposed to people living in other types of uh, territories, separated really uh, by, by boundaries. Well, that's an idea, it's a very, uh, a recent and an exceptional idea, I think, in, uh, in history. Uh, it's the result of the Congress of Vienna, of the defeat of Napoleon 15 kilometers south of Brussels uh, here. Uh, and that idea formatted uh, the, the actual and still formats the actual uh, uh, Europe. And what in fact happened is that the, this kind of homogeneous territorialization covered up, covered up urbanity uh, that is radically different of such a conception of uh, society. In cities, you live together on the basis of difference. You live together on the basis uh, not only of different cultures, uh, not only uh, uh, of, but of different uh, practices, of different uh, uh, enterprises. The city is built around a market, and a market uh, has nothing uh, fundamentally to do with, with, with privatization, that's a specific form. The market has to do with exchange. And you cannot, you don't need exchange between totally equal uh, positions. Exchange needs some kind of difference and some kind of valuing, measuring uh, kinds of, uh, uh, of difference. And that's the place where uh, you could say both politics uh, and creativity and innovation uh, take, uh, take place. So my basic uh, uh, analysis of, uh, let's say, of this broad uh, vision on, on, on history is that the modern nation state covered up, covered up basic elements of, let's say, modernity that, were, uh, that, 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 that you could find in, in this early uh, urban uh, uh, developments. Just as a side remark, you have to to, to look, that was one of the maps I would have shown you, 
uh, uh, these, these uh, night images from satellites of, uh, of Europe. Eh? You, you must have uh, encountered them already. Well, look at, look at the figure. Europe is not a homogeneous territory. You see a center and you see peripheries really occurring in these uh, light structures. And what you basically see emerging again is this late medieval, uh, early modern structure of Europe with the, the urban development in, in the low countries on the one hand, uh, at the other, the other pole, the northern Italian uh, developments and related, you could say, basically with the Rhine, with the Rhine structure, which still is the blue banana uh, of the European structure. But that is covered up, that is covered up by a story of national territories uh, uh, with, with a, a homogeneous uh, cultural uh, uh, story uh, behind it with, with the Europe of, of, of member states that is, uh, in my view, covering up the real structuring, the real functioning of the, uh, of the continent. Now, what is happening today is a shift, not back to history, but in fact to a comparable, uh, uh, comparable uh, structure. The globalization process of, let's say, the last 30, 35 years breaks open these boundaries of the national states of the, uh, uh, of the nation states. Uh, the globalization uh, process, in fact, is basically also an urbanization process. I'll give you just two, uh, two, two, two figures. In the beginning of the 20th century, 10% of the world population lived in cities. In the beginning of the 21st century, more than half of the world population lives in cities, and in the most developed continents, that is up to 80% of the population. If you look at it in absolute figures, it's more or less 220 million human beings living in cities in 1900, and it is now up to 5 billion human beings. So in fact, humanity has become an urban species, and we don't know it yet. We still are in a, uh, let's say, in a territorial or basically suburban, suburban uh, uh, mentality. We still think that living together is living together on the basis of what you have in common. Most of the people think that, uh, that, that, that the social bond is based on, on commonality cultural commonality, the nation state, if you have uh, the workers' movement, it's uh, class uh, interest uh, commonality. Uh, if you ask individual people, uh, why are you together with, with your partner, people spontaneously refer to, to sameness. Uh, we both like to go to the cinema or to, uh, we like this and that. Uh, I always invite people then to do the mental exercise and make the column of what is not in common. And if you are together, because of the, the elements that are already in common, most of the people have good arguments not to stay together. Uh, and if you point that out, they say, yes, but it's not yet in common. We are going to put it in common. At, at, at our age, we know that uh, that illusion is absolutely necessary to make bonding, uh, uh, but basically uh, succeeding in that is not necessary to maintain the bond. What does this teach us? It teaches us that we have to focus also to the, to the, 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 the capacity, in fact, of, uh, uh, of bridging. We are still thinking that, that we are together because of the bonds, and the bonds is around sameness. What is happening in cities, what is the big challenge in cities is bridging, is bridging differences, is, is connecting people that are not yet connected or are not automatically connected because of sameness. And we have to accept that, that in, in an urban uh, situation we have irreducible, irreducible differences. That we will have to learn together even accepting that kind of, uh, 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 of difference. So building the urban commons in a certain way needs to be creative or to formulate it in another way, in another way have uh, communities have their place in the cities. But the idea, the idea of nationalists, of everybody wanting to make culturally homogeneous uh, uh, territories, the idea uh, uh, of nation states, uh, uh, in fact, is, is, is the opposite. The idea is that you have to enter the community, the Gemeinschaft, 
and that on the basis of the community you build a society, a Gesellschaft, Gemeinschaft, Gesellschaft, community, society. That is the basic notions of making, uh, uh, of making a society of a society work. And that is basically, that is basically also the, the basic ideas of sociology, very, very recent uh, uh, science, in fact, at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the, of the 20th century. Well, I don't think that fits to the urban condition. That doesn't fit to the urban condition. In cities, you have different communities, and you have to accept the existence of different communities, religious communities, language uh, uh, communities, uh, <coughs> lifestyle communities, you, uh, you name it. Society living together is based on accepting that difference. And so society is intercultural or even transcultural. Society is based on bridging and not on classical, uh, classical uh, uh, bonding. So basically, uh, my point of view is, first of all, that, let's say, the urban dynamics and urbanity uh, uh, is a condition also for innovation, for creativity in general, because it's the place of living together with a lot of people on a small territory and doing all kinds of different things. So it is not based on tradition, not based on a common history. Uh, if you look at, at, at the national legitimation, in fact, uh, the nation is built on, on a story of a common history. And it's that that delivers tradition, identity, representative democracy, uh, that is not only meant to represent the differences within the community, but is also meant to, to maintain the continuity of the institutions and of the territory, uh, uh, basically. Uh, uh, and that is all opposed to what happens in cities. If we in Brussels, we have to build first common roots, a common history to legitimize uh, uh, our living together, I think we, we fail before we start. We don't have common roots. We don't have a common history. So we cannot build on a common tradition. What we have is a common future, maybe, a common destination. We are bound by destiny. We are forced, we are forced to live together on accepting that kind of difference. And that doesn't deliver a strong identity. That doesn't deliver a strong, uh, a, a strong, uh, let's say, <coughs> strong story uh, line. Urban identities are weak identities, are hybrid uh, identities, are uh, uh, a city is under construction and even under construction without a master plan. Uh, everybody uh, has to read the city. We don't know whether when we see building blocks they are parts of ruins or they are parts of projects. We have to relate to all these, uh, uh, these different elements and that's a, a hybrid operation and that hybrid operation cannot easily be represented in institutions, in structures. We have to participate. A city needs co-production. And that is why participatory democracy is a typical urban question. And even it's not territorialized as a nation state, it is much more uh, uh, organized in networks. So in that sense, urbanity is the opposite uh, uh, of national culture. Urban culture and national culture, they both exist they both uh, uh, are, are there. And I think to, to end, to use this marvelous city is a, is a, is a, is a big example uh, uh, of what I am, uh, what I am, am I, what I'm telling. Note down some figures for you. The Brussels capital region is 1.1 million inhabitants. One third of them have no Belgian uh, uh, na uh, national ID card. Eh? The most uh, important uh, other group are the French, 53,500. Then comes the Moroccans, 40,600. Then the Italians, 28,000. The Polish, the Spanish, etc. Well, normally people think that there, is, there are more Moroccans than French people. Uh, well, that is explained because the French never become Belgian. Uh, while a lot of Moroccans accept to, uh, to change of nationality, if you include these changes of nationality, the majority of the population, the majority of the population of Brussels has no Belgo-Belgian references. And the Belgian state, 
offers to all these people even two ways of integration. You have the Flemish community and you have the French-speaking community. It's the only city in the world that doesn't have cultural uh, competences. Uh, the, 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 I speak about the 19 municipalities, the region, the region only has territorial competences. You could say that two, uh, uh, <clears throat> two uh, border states are operating in that city with their socio-cultural reproduction uh, offers, uh, cultural centers, uh, schools, uh, artistic programs, uh, uh, etc. Based on a monocultural, monolinguistic, uh, uh, let's say, approach that is maybe working for the other territories that can be monolinguistic, but is not working for, uh, for Brussels. Because you have even more than two languages. Brought you some other figures. As far as a language use is concerned at home, French is not even the dominant language used in the majority of households. 47% of the households only use French as the uh, dominant. The, the second dominant language in, in, in private conversation is English, 16% of the households, 13% Dutch, in 10% it's forms of, uh, uh, of Arab. So the multilingual uh, reality of Brussels is, uh, is absolutely, well, it's, it's not made visible by the representation mechanisms in, 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 uh, uh, in Belgium. If you ask people which languages they speak well or, or in an excellent form, 88% would say we speak French. So French is absolutely the lingua franca uh, in Brussels. 30% answer, we do speak English rather well. Dutch is 23%. Uh, uh, percent. And what strikes me most and, 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 and is absolutely, uh, 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 let's say, supportive of, of my argument, that is that the uh, households where there is only one language spoken are a minority of the households. Only 5.5% of the households only use Dutch and only 33% of the households only use French. Dutch and French are combined in 14 other percents of the households, French and another language in 15% and other languages, two or more other languages in, in 32%, which means that 61% of the households in Brussels are, multi, are multilingual. And so hybridity is the main characteristic of, uh, of that city, hybridity that we saw last week when the, Zinnike parade, uh, when the Zinnike parade went out. So what is happening in Brussels and what is obscuring, I think, the creative and in innovative uh, program and demands that we need to, to, to build a, a living together is that, in fact, Brussels is not enough city, it's too much state that in fact the state's institutions, which are still communitarian, which are still nation-based or nations in formation, do dominate the social cultural reproduction and obscure the emergence of what is, really, uh, what is really there. And that explains also why in Brussels the politic political representation and the political structures uh, uh, of, uh, of the urbanity and of the city are at odds with what is really happening in civil society. We have a very active and a very diverse civil society that is also well trained in lying to the structures. Because if you, uh, if you have an initiative, uh, you fill in the forms uh, uh, in Dutch, uh, doing as if it's a Flemish project, if, that, if there is no subsidy coming there, you're translated in another language. Uh, if you don't get the uh, subsidy at the region, you try at the city level or European level. I mean, we are very inventive, in fact, in, in playing the game as if, as if it is possible to represent uh, society in Brussels in forms of monolinguistic, monocultural uh, uh, formats. That is, you could say, an instituted uh, lie uh, between the population, between the population and, uh, uh, and the institutions. But basically, basically, what is at stake is that the intercultural field is the only field, the only field where uh, society can be thought or built. 
It's, it's the field of bridging. It's the field of multicultural encounter, uh, uh, in fact, that has to be developed. And it has to be developed on the basis of different elements that are reproduced in communitarian, monolinguistic, traditional forms. There is nothing against, uh, there is nothing against these kinds of, uh, uh, of continuities. But there is a absolute, let's say, uh, how would I say, an absolute uh, uh, condition for communities to survive in an urban context. That is that they have to rec recognize their own lack, their own incompleteness, which of course for communities is a very difficult thing to do. But they have to accept that within the cultural community there is no sufficient material to build the whole society that they need the other, that the other, and even the radical other, is absolutely necessary uh, to, to think even, to think even society, that it is impossible, that it is impossible to think a city, to make a social bond without these creative, innovative operation to, of bridging. And that is not a given thing. Nobody in one socialization uh, uh, field uh, has sufficient material to think that bridging without the collaboration of the, uh, uh, of the other. And that's the, the central message, I, uh, in fact, I want to put uh, in, in front of the, of the, of the discussion. Let me, let me end with a, let's say, more or less <coughs> philosophical uh, uh, reference. In the beginning of modernity, one century, the century of enlightenment, to think the possibility of living together without sharing religion. A lot of philosophers, early modern philosophers, Spinoza uh, to, name, to name one of them, needed to write a lot of books about God and the position of God and the relationship with God to put religion somewhere uh, and, make, and, and free a field for a democratic political uh, uh, philosophy. And most, let's say, I, I, I don't think that the majority of the world population is already convinced of that, that you can live together without sharing religion. But the West tells us that one of the basic, of the founding, uh, uh, of the founding elements of modernity is the separation between state and religion. No state, no state religion. Well, what we did in the 19th century is abolishing, uh, abolishing that, but is introducing state culture. We have organized the European states on the basis of one official cultural linguistic uh, field for socialization. And we have told the whole history in terms of that kind of monocultural uh, approaches. I do think that maybe the 21st century should become a new century of enlightenment and that we have to think the possibility of living together without sharing cultures uh, and having the possibility of living together in a multicultural on a multicultural uh, uh, basis i know it is very difficult to think because we are not socialized in that uh, uh, direction in that uh, uh, orientation but it's only the beginning of our century so we probably have to make an appointment uh, at the end of, uh, of the century, meet again and see how far, uh, how far we are. But anyway, I do think that the city we are sharing together is a very good uh, uh, laboratory uh, to, thinking, to thinking that process. But of if we want to emerge as members of a Brussels, uh, uh, of a Brussels urbanity, in fact, we will have uh, to bridge uh, those, uh, those difference, maintaining linguistic, monetarian, uh, 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 let's say, memberships, but combining them with what has to really to, to emerge in, in the first place is the relationship to this, uh, to this uh, multicultural, multi-religious, multilinguistic uh, city and to find a way, an innovative and a creative way, in fact, uh, to, uh, to emancipate to emancipate from tradition, to emancipate from nationalist uh, uh, views, uh, and to, uh, to develop uh, uh, that, uh, that line. I have to stop here, but the argument would continue to say, let's really become what we are, a small world city, 
and let's take up the real mission of becoming the real capital of uh, Europe. Because the same story goes for the European unification process. The European unification process will not go further if there is no Europeanness in a certain way thought. Uh, and that Europeanness will have to go back, I think, to the pre national, to the pre national uh, position of these network cities that, uh, that are late medieval products and still exist, uh, uh, in fact, and probably representing Europe as a network of metropolitan areas, of multicultural, multilinguistic metropolitan areas, is a better way to think the European unification than to, than, than, than to only build it on a system of members, member states. But to speak about that, I'm ready to come back another, another morning.